emotion. We're glad you're here. Come on, stand up to your feet. Let's worship together. The name of the
you are all goodness and all kindness and all mercy and all love. That by your grace, we have been saved simply through our faith. And it's all you, it's your righteousness, it's your goodness. And we are recipients of that, but it's not us. Thank you, we pray that you would open our eyes to that truth more and more today. In the name of Jesus, we love you. You're so good. Amen, amen. Can we give God a hand? Well, guys, thanks so much for worshiping with us today. Hey, you can be seated, but welcome somebody before you grab a seat. Tell them it's good to see you today at Motion Church. Let them know. Well, glad to have everybody today. My name is Nolan. This is my wife, Abley. We have the privilege of pastoring here. Abley? If I didn't get my wife's name right, I'm going to hear that later. You know what I'm saying? But glad you guys are here today. Hey, um, we, we know there's so many things you could be doing on a Sunday morning, but the fact that you're here, man, it's special to us. We, we really appreciate that. Thanks for being a part. And babe, we got some special people with us in the house or watching online. We welcome you guys as well. Who is it? Yeah, hey, we're so glad that you guys are here. If it is your first time, we always say this every week. You guys are our MVPs, and so we're glad that you're here. And we... <laughs> some VIPs. MVP, but they're the valuable players too. Okay, valuable. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Well, <laughs> here we are. We just want to meet you, and we're so glad that you guys are here. So we want to be able to put a face to a name, shake your hand, hug your neck, and say thank you for checking out what God's doing at Motion Church. Truly is our honor, yeah, and is. we want to give you a free gift. So on your way out, stop by the Motion Tent. We'd love to meet you. Glad you guys are here. And if you are new or newer to Motion Church, you're like, hey, I, I want to take that next step. I, I want to go from just showing up on Sundays and becoming a part of the family. We say that a lot here. We're more than just a Sunday morning hangout or a place to go and, and worship. I Man, God's called us to be a family as the body of Christ. And so that next step for you is our next steps class. And so that's gonna be immediately following service today. So we'll take about a five minute break. You guys can do your thing, run and use the restroom, grab some water, and then we'll meet in here. If you need childcare, childcare will be provided. Just let them know next door. And so that way we can, can just talk about who we are as a church, where we've been, where we're going, and then how you can jump on board and become a part of that. So after service, join us. I'd love for you to get connected at Motion and all that God's doing here. Yeah, hey, for our ladies only. Ladies. Ladies in the house, one way that you guys can get connected with us, every month, the third Saturday of the month, we have girls' coffee or ladies' coffee because there's Jesus, family, and then there's coffee, right? And I actually... Priorities, people. I met somebody right before service that loves tea, and so... We'll have tea for you as well. Uh, Are but, they British? Well, it's a long story. Okay. But we're glad to have tea for you as well. But come, be a part. It really is so much fun. I know that a lot of us girls are, uh, we always say like, I don't know anybody. I only talk to one person here. But after we have these girls' coffees, people are making connections and friendships are yeah. forming. And it's so powerful to do life with other Christ followers. We need each other. So get here Saturday the 20th. It'll be at 930. I know the guys do eight. But we like to sleep in, so. And it's at the church. It's not here at, at the, the church, crack, yes. yes. At the There'll church. be food, pastries, coffee, tea, all the good things. So. And I'm, gonna, I'm about to speak some more people's love language. We're talking about food. So next month is the month of May. The 5th of May is also known as Cinco de Mayo for us gringos. But what's great is we get to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. And so what we're going to do as a church family, we're going to have like a cook-off, okay? So we're going to have tacos provided by the church. But then we're gonna have like a cook-off of the best guacamole, the best queso, mm. and the best salsa. Yes, amen. So if you wanna if you wanna start thinking about that, praying about that, and listen, can I just preface this? There are some gringos in the house, and so don't make it like where I die eating your salsa, okay? You're the only one that I okay, think we can take. But just it. keep me in mind when you're making that stuff. It doesn't need to be that spicy, well, and okay, also, people? Nolan, if they wanna try it out before to make sure it's acceptable. We can do that for them. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll gladly take, for the take team. that for the team. We'll if you do that. So the, the sign up is going to be on the app next week, but we want to give you guys a heads up. Make sure to be here to eat some good food and then also be a part of that competition. Three different contests. We'll have some gift card prizes for the winners. It's going to be a lot of fun. I like to eat. I feel like we love to eat here at Motion Church, yeah. and I love that we love to yeah. eat, so thank you, Jesus. But hey, we are in a goofy mood, but thank you guys so much for your giving. We're so thankful and honored that you guys are obedient to God and you give back to him. And I know we were talking with a family this week how God's so faithful when we yeah. take and we honor his word and we give back what he's already given us. He takes it and blesses it, and so I know that I want to see that blessing in your life, but thank you guys. Um, yeah. You can give three ways online, the app, on your way out. So, Well, guys, let's get ready for today's message. What's 
What's up, everybody? Once again, welcome to Motion. Glad having you guys here. I just want to say it's good to have you the week after Easter, right? Because everybody shows up on Easter Sunday, but you showed up the week after Easter. And so just give yourself a hand for that. Making church a priority for you and your family, it's important. And so for, for us as a church, prior to Easter, Palm Sunday, now we started out the year in the book of Ephesians and worked all the way through the book of Ephesians to start the year out. And so as we're approaching Easter, like of course I know what I'm gonna preach about on Easter, like Jesus, right? But, but where are we gonna go after Easter? And so just through, through some conversations with people, through praying and really thinking about it, what we're gonna do over the next probably month or month or two is we're just gonna hop back into another book of the Bible and just dive into it. Because how many know this? The Bible is applicable, it's relevant, it's important to our lives in such a way that it meets us where we are and it challenges us and it changes us. And rather than doing a, a cute, trendy teaching series, which we're, there's a time and a place for that and we'll do those again, I just really feel like for our church, I mean, it's important for us to dig into God's word and to really find and see what he has and where we, we should grow and understand him in a greater way. So we started out, like I said, in Ephesians, we're not gonna be going very far. We're gonna hop over one book in the Bible to the next one, and we're gonna jump into the book of Colossians. And so to give you a little bit of a insight into this, this book, it was actually written by the Apostle Paul as a letter to a church in the city of Colossae. And so he wrote this letter to the church, and you're like, well, if it was written to them, what is it, how, how is it applicable to us? Well, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul as he wrote that. So, so not only was it relevant to this church back 2,000 years ago in ancient, the ancient world, but for us in 2024 in San Antonio, Texas at Motion Church, it's just as applicable, just as relevant for us. And for what we're gonna be looking at to really make sense, we've gotta kinda get an idea of, of why Paul wrote this letter in the first place. So back when I, was, when I was 16, when I was in high school, I got my first actual job, my, my first actual job. I started uh, when I was like a little kid mowing yards in the neighborhood, which I think all teenagers are, are, are younger, should like find a, find a way to make money. This is crazy. When I was like, I was like 10 or 11 years old, we lived in Denton, Texas. We lived in this, this neighborhood where they're doing a lot of building. Tons of new houses going up all over the neighborhood. And so I, I, I look back and I cannot believe my parents allowed me to do this. When I was 10 or 11, what I would do is I would get a, a big cooler on either side of the handlebars on my bicycle. I'd fill one with different types of soda, one with water, and I would go to these different houses where I saw trucks where workers were at inside, and I'd walk into the houses with these coolers and sell Coke and water for a dollar. Like my, my wife, if our kids are in our enclosed backyard, they think they're, she thinks they're gonna get kidnapped, right? And my, my parents at 10 or 11 let me go to random neighborhoods, talk to random men and sell them Coke. Anyways, so my, my first actual job, 16, I worked at a restaurant called Rib Crib, which by the way, nothing says Oklahoma like Rib Crib, you know what I'm saying? Worked at Rib Crib and I was a, I was a waiter there. Which, which I loved waiting tables. If you've ever waited tables, you either loved it or you hated it. But I, I love waiting tables. It was a fun job, made good money for that age. And I, I was good at it in the sense that I could always cover up my, my mistakes. So what I would do, thankfully the Lord's worked on me since then. But what happened is that if I was, if I forgot to put an order in, I'd go back to the table, I'd be like, guys, I'm so sorry. Our printer in the kitchen broke. And so we're behind. Or if I, I forgot something, like I forgot to take off an ingredient, I'd say, man, I'm so sorry, but the cook's new. I'll get it fixed for you. And I'm, I've become more saved since then, okay? The Lord is still working on me to make me what he wants me. I don't know how that kid's church song goes. But he's still working on me, all right? But while I was working there, the, this rib crib, was a, it was a corporation. It was a, a chain of, of different restaurants. And so they, they started noticing throughout the company that they were having issues. There were, there were managers that weren't really following the proper protocols, proper guidelines of the company, there were, were cooks at these different restaurants that were trying to add their own flair and their own spin to the food that was being made. And some of the restaurants had just gotten really off track from who they were and from what the company was originally supposed to be. So, so the CEO of this, this rib crib company sends out a personal video to all of us, all of the employees, uh, just kind of kind of talking to us. And then it had a, a bunch of training videos and then new standard operating procedures. All of the stuff that we could follow to fix the problem 
and get everybody back in alignment. So why this morning am I talking about a restaurant named Rib Crib and what does that have to do with us in San Antonio? Well, what, what the CEO did for this company is kind of what's taking place in the book of Colossians. Like I mentioned, there's this church in the city called Colossae, which was, it's in modern day Turkey, if you wanna kind of understand where it's at. And for this church, things started out really good. It was healthy, people are getting saved, they're following Jesus, they're growing in community. All the stuff that you'd wanna see in a church that's pursuing Jesus and that's healthy. Well, the problem became is that there were some people that snuck into this church that, that started to add things. Kind of like the, the cooks would at Rib Crib, they'd add a little spice here, that they'd change up things here, that they'd make a little bit of a shift in the recipe as if, as if the original recipe wasn't good enough. And what happened is they, they started to teach things, this is important, they started to teach things like Jesus plus. They started to teach things like, like Jesus plus more. That they'd say, in order to actually be saved, you got to be doing these specific things always. In order to really be a Christian, you got to follow these certain customs. In order to be a quote-unquote real believer, you got to abstain from these foods and these certain drinks and this kind of, of, of things. And really what was going on here is these people had snuck into the church and they were watering down the gospel. And they were adding unnecessary rules that Jesus never intended. Uh, un, un, unrequired hoops for people to jump through, and, and they were making faith a whole lot more difficult. Uh, essentially what they were teaching, which sounds crazy to think about, but they were, they were teaching Jesus was good, like what he did was good, but, but what Jesus did wasn't enough. There's more that you've got to do to actually be considered a true follower of God. And they were adding religion back into the mix when Jesus came to abolish religion because he came to give us relationship. So these, these false teachers are, are preaching this junk and it starts to sneak into the church and, and, and I doubt the people would actually say it, but we, we can see that they began to believe it by their actions that Jesus wasn't enough, which is, which is really sad. But as I was thinking about that church versus the, the Christian world today, that, that's where a lot of Christians are stuck believing. Like we celebrated Easter last week but we know what Easter means, what it represents. Jesus went to the cross. He died for our sins. He was raised back to life, beating sin, beating death. And now you and I, because of Jesus, get to have a relationship with God. We, we know that, we say that, but, but for whatever reasons, our, our actions and maybe our thoughts kind of believe in, and say that Jesus wasn't quite enough. In fact, there, there are some churches that, that teach that way. And, and they would never come right out and say, hey guys, Jesus wasn't enough. That's, like, that's enough to get you booed off of any Christian stage in America. That's like a pastor saying he doesn't love Chick-fil-A. You don't say you don't love Chick-fil-A if you don't love Jesus. And I know some of you that don't love Chick-fil-A, I'm praying for you. You guys need some help. But, but what's often taught in churches is something like this. Yeah, you're saved, but, but in order to, to really be saved, you gotta you got make sure to do this and that and the other. Make sure you're staying away from this and, and participating in that. Don't think this way. Don't mess up. Read your Bible and pray every single day. Be perfect. And so the question comes into people's minds, and this is something I've struggled with early on in my walk with God, was am I saved or am I not? The, the struggle came, am I, am I doing enough good and am I staying away from enough bad to actually be saved? And I think all of us, we've all thought that, I, I hope I'm good enough to actually be saved because right now, with the things that I, I've done, the things that I'm doing, I, I don't feel like I am. So, so the question comes up, this is what I want, want to address today. Does Jesus save us or is it a combination of Jesus plus us? Does Jesus save us or is it a combination of Jesus plus us? That, that's what has snuck into the mindset of the Christians in the church in Colossae. And that's the central reason for Paul writing this letter. He, he wants them to stop falling for the trap of religion. So in the beginning of chapter one, Paul starts out with this greeting to, to the people in this church. He, he would do that in all the letters that he wrote to different churches. But, but in, in chapter one of Colossians, 
it's a little bit longer than he, he typically would write. He, he kind of goes into more detail, and, and the reason why he does that is he's never met the people in this church, in the Colossian church. He, he'd never met them, he'd never been there, they'd never heard him preach. One of the guys that got saved under Paul's ministry actually planted this church, but they, they didn't know who he was at all. So it, it's kind of hard to like write a letter and just start out by saying, hey, my name's Paul, you're wrong, right? That's, that's not gonna be received very well. It's, it's not, gonna, not gonna, if I had a guest speaker come to Motion Church and they started out with, hey, Motion Church, my name's so-and-so. Now, let me tell you why all of you are wrong and are doing it horribly. You'd be like, can we get security or safety team to remove this fool? Because we don't know who he is. How's he gonna come correct us? So, so Paul talks about in chapter one, the, the first part, basically his credentials, who, who he is, how he'd been appointed by Christ and Christ had shown up and revealed himself to him. And he was doing that to prove to the people that he was worth listening to and that what he was about to write was actually correct and it was from God. And then we get to chapter, or verses 15 through 23 where we're gonna spend our time today. But back to my, my rib crib analogy, my first job. Re remember the CEO, he sends out this video along with the training videos and the SOPs. When, when that happened, when he addressed the company, he didn't send out this video and say, listen up employees, all of you have been horrible, you've been getting it wrong, you're making a mess of things, our, our, our restaurant and our food is trash. He didn't scold anybody. He didn't reprimand, he didn't berate us. He simply told us the right way. Here's, here's how we do it and why. And, and that's what Paul, that's the approach Paul takes with this Colossian church. He doesn't write the letter, hey, I'm Paul, here are my credentials, here's why you should listen. Have I got your attention? Okay, all of you are idiots for believing this trash that's being taught. What are you thinking? That's not what Paul did. Paul simple, simply told them what was right and what was true. And in this passage we're gonna look at today, it's, it's probably the greatest explanation of who Jesus is and the defense of Jesus in the, in the entire Bible. If you're like a Bible nerd and you study theology, it's the, the greatest passage when it comes to what's called Christology, which is the, the study of Christ. It's the most important to, to understand the, the gravity and the greatness and the magnitude of who Jesus is. So basically, Paul, what we're about to read, he's like, so, so you think that Jesus isn't enough to save you? You think that, that Jesus isn't all that you need and, and, and you need yourself and you need your good deeds? All right, that, that's cool. I see how you think that way. Let, let me show you how you're wrong by showing you how great Jesus is. And, and friends, what we know and what we think about Jesus is the most important thing in this world. Let me say that again. What we think about Jesus is the most important thing in this world. And that might sound hyperbolic or, or for, for a pastor to say something like that, but what we think about Jesus what we have convinced in our mind and in our heart is the most important thing in our lives. So if you're following along in the sermon notes tab on our motion app, the title of today's message is The Superiority of Christ. Superiority of Christ, actually probably in your Bible that the title for these, this, this area is The Supremacy of Christ, but I never use the word supremacy, I use like superiority, so I just switched it for our sermon. The Superiority of Christ. So the, the Colossian church, They'd gotten to a place and they'd listened to lies and, 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 and wrong teaching and maybe lies they told themselves or that they had, they had been taught. They, they'd forgotten how amazing Jesus was. And, and they, and sometimes we, need a reminder. So, so Paul writes this about Jesus and how he was more than enough for the people back then and how he's still more than enough for us in our lives today. So here, here's how he starts out. Let's take a look at chapter one, verses 15 through 17. They're on the screens. He says, Christ is the, invisible, or the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. If I, if I had to put a title on these three verses of Paul's defense for Christ and why he's sufficient, 
It would be Jesus' superiority in creation. I mean, after the first line there, he could have dropped the mic and been done. Think about the magnitude of the statement, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Like, you, you wanna doubt the power of Jesus? Well, that's gonna be pretty hard because when you see Jesus, you actually see God. Jesus is God. Have you, have you ever had a boss say something like to you and your team like, hey, whenever I'm out of the office or I'm gonna be on vacation and, and while I'm out of the office, so-and-so is gonna be, they're gonna be here in my place. They're, they're gonna be here in my stead. So listen to them, respect them, do what they ask because they're taking my place since I can't be here. Now, when our bosses tell us that and they leave, do we actually listen to the person that they tell us to listen to? Not really, right? Why? Because they aren't the actual person. They're, they're not the boss. They don't have the authority. They don't have the power. They're just filling in. It's like, oh, whatever, bro. You're not the real boss. Like, like the, the TV show, The Office. Any Office fans? Any, any fans of The Office? Kind of throwback. So like, imagine Michael Scott has got to be out of town, and he tells the, the office workers, he says, hey, well, I'm gone. What I need you guys to do, I'm, I'm placing Dwight Schrute as as my guy in charge, so listen to him, respect him, follow what he does. If he did that, when, when Mike, Michael Scott left, would anybody listen to Dwight? No, first off, because he's dumb, but second, because he's actually not the one in charge. So what, what scripture is saying here is that Jesus was not a representative for God here on earth. He, he, he's, like, he's not saying, hey, listen to, listen to Jesus because he's, he's here in God's stead. The Bible is saying that Jesus is God. But when we see Jesus in scripture, when we hear his words, when we learn about what he did, that was God because Jesus is God. And not only is Jesus God, but he's always been. He's not a created being. We're created beings. Angels are created beings. That kind of snuck into the church in, in Colossae that they thought that maybe he was like an angel that was sent by God, but that those are created. But it's saying there that he's not a created, he's the creator. He created everything. And that the Savior is able to save because he's also the creator. So think about this. When, when you see that beautiful sunset, that was Jesus. When you're on top of a mountain, you see the, the landscape that's just breathtaking. That was Jesus. When you're in Mexico and your, your toes are in the sand and you're on a little lawn chair there and you're looking out at the crystal blue water, anybody need a vacation? Come on, let's go, baby. Let's all take a motion trip to Mexico. Let's go. But when you see that, that was Jesus. Jesus is God. He's the creator. And it says that he holds creation together. I'm full of old school Christian songs this morning. You remember that song? He's got the whole world in his hands. The he that he's talking about in that song that we're singing about, that's Jesus. He, he's the one that does it all. So we're off to a pretty good start of why we can trust our salvation with Jesus because he's God. He's the creator of everything. Paul continues. Let's jump it to verses 18 through 20. He says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He's the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he's first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Title for these verses would be Jesus' superiority in the new creation. His superiority in the new creation. Now, wh why do I say that? If, if Jesus is God and he created the first creation, then why did he need to create a new one, right? Why, why would he need to do that? Did, did Jesus mess up on the first creation? Did he not read the blueprints quite right? Did, did Jesus put the earth and the, the heavens and the universe together like I do Ikea furniture the first time and always jack it up? No. Jesus isn't the one that messed it up. We did. Humanity did. When we chose sin over God. And what happened? That sin came in and it caused us to be separated from God. God was over here. We were over here. It was an insurmountable distance. And God loved us so much that, that he couldn't stand for that. 
God couldn't go on eternity without you and me. He, he couldn't do it, and we could never be good enough to earn God's love on our own. Remember, that distance was insurmountable. So God the Father sent God the Son, Jesus, to earth. Jesus came to earth so that he could die on a cross. And what's so interesting is that that first creation that we read about in the book of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Right? The first creation began with things coming to life. This new creation started with a death. But what did verse 20 say? It says, on the cross, Jesus reconciled everything. Everything. All of our wrong, all of our sin, all the junk that we've done, all of our past, all of our mistakes. And Jesus made peace in heaven and on earth, and he made peace in our life and in our souls. And Jesus' death, it started a new thing. Start a new thing, and that new thing is, it's kind of, it's kind of twofold. That this new creation is is here on earth. We get to experience it now, and also it's an eternity in heaven forever. Well, what's the new creation here on earth? It's the church. The, the new creation started with this death, but but it began with the this new life, and it's people coming to Christ, and it established the church. And and I'm not just talking about motion church. I'm not that short sighted in my thinking. I'm talking about the church, the the body of Christ, Christians all around the world. God has brought us all together and united us in him. I mean, think about it before. Everybody was separated by by, by nationality, by socioeconomic status, by by race, by gender, by whatever, whatever used to separate people before. Now, because of what Jesus did, he's united us all under the cross all together. And he's the head. He's our leader. And Jesus is building something beautiful in his church. And listen, is the church perfect? No. Why? Because the church is made up of imperfect people that are trying to follow a risen Savior as best that we, as we can. So the church is imperfect, but, but it's what God has given us here on this earth to walk in and to live in and take ground for, for Jesus in this world. So we experience this new creation here on earth. And also... We'll get to experience this new creation after death. That verse we, we read just a moment ago, it said that Jesus was the first to rise from death. And when we die and leave this earth, we'll rise. Not like the walking dead, don't get freaked out. But we'll rise and we'll get to live in this, this new heaven, in this new earth that's gonna be created for us for eternity. So Jesus is not only superior in creation, he created all of this, but he's superior, superior in the fact that he made another way and something so much greater than we could ever find or accomplish on our own. Well, we'll jump to 21, verse, verses 21 through 23. Paul writes, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. The last thought here, it's on the screens, Jesus can be superior in your life. Jesus can be superior in your life. And if I, if I could take that, that thought a little bit further, is that Jesus can be, and Jesus wants to be, and Jesus is able to be superior in your life if you allow him to. If you allow him to. And this, is, this here is, is exactly what, what is talking to, exactly to those of us that have accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. He's the Lord of our life. What does it say? He says that we were once far away from God, which we were. It says that we were enemies of God and that we were separated from him because of the way that we lived. And we were. We we had no way to change that reality in and of ourselves. It was insurmountable. There was nothing we could do. We, We could never try hard enough, do good enough, strive enough. It was impossible for us to be good enough for God. But Jesus made a way. 
And because he went to the cross and he paid the price for our sins and he died for us, we're united with God. We're no longer separated. We're no longer spiritual orphans. We're, we're no longer on the hook for the lives that we've lived and the things that we've done. Now we get to have relationship with him. And, and, and check out what this says. It says that we're holy and blameless in God's sight and able to stand before him without a single fault. Whenever you look at yourself, do you think that about you? When you look at yourself, do you think, man, I, I, I'm holy and I'm blameless and I don't got a single fault. Most of us don't look at ourselves and see us that way because all we see is what we've done. But when God looks at us, he doesn't see us and our sins. He sees Jesus and the atonement and the price that he paid for our sins, washing us clean. So what, what if we began to think the way that God thinks about us in Jesus? What if when you look at yourself in the mirror, rather than saying, man, you did that, you messed up again, you're a failure. What if you realize the way that God sees you because Jesus is in you? It would change your life drastically. Jesus did it. And, and here's the thing, friends, here's why Paul's writing this. Because there are some people in that church all the way back then that had forgotten about the superiority of Jesus. They'd forgotten that he was actually the creator. He, he was the creator that spoke the world into existence. They, they had forgotten that he was the creator that, that had come to the world when he died on the cross. They'd forgotten that he was all that they needed to be saved. They'd forgotten that he was enough for them. They, they thought that it was Jesus plus because he wasn't enough. They'd forgotten that he was sufficient for them. So Paul says, Colossians 1.23 again, it's on the screens. He says, now that you know who Jesus is, now that you know he created everything, that he's God, he gave you a new way, he's rescued you, he's made you holy and blameless. Now that you know this, he says, you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't, don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. Don't drift away. We as humans have a tendency to drift, don't we? Don't drift away. Now, I know I'm from Oklahoma, but I love Texas. I'm diehard Texas. Love it. We lived in Florida for a couple years. I was like, I gotta get back to Texas, baby. I love Texas. So I love it, but I'm not gonna lie to myself. I'm not gonna lie to you and say that Texas is the most beautiful place in the world. I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. Like, I know like in the hill country, you see some beautiful stuff. You go to Canyon Lake and it's, it's gorgeous, but I'm not gonna lie to you and say, we live in the most beautiful state, beautiful place in the entire world. I'm not gonna say that because we don't. Like imagine living in the Swiss Alps, right? Imagine living like Machu Picchu, Peru, and you get to see the beauty of that. Imagine living in the Maldives. Imagine all these beautiful, imagine living in a place where you could see the aurora borealis every night, the northern lights. How incredible would that be? And then if you were there and you asked a person that lived there their whole life, man, do you get ever, you ever get used to how beautiful it is here? You get to see this every single day. Do you ever get used to it? I promise that person's going to say never. Every single day, I'm just, it's beautiful. You know what? They're lying. They're lying when they say that. Because of course they get used to it. Of course they do. A lot of things excite us at first and, and then they just get routine and it kind of just slips. You have your first kiss, it's unforgettable. Oh my gosh, I got my first kiss, that's amazing. Kiss thousand, kiss 10,000, it's like routine. I'm not saying you, babe. It's always good. <laughs> it's always good. You get the, I got a joke for <laughs> the laugh behind me, I like that. You, you get that, that dream job and, and you're so excited, you finally land it, you've been waiting for it forever, six months in, a year in, and uh, it's like, oh, it's a cool job. I want something else, it just kind of gets routine. You get married, you're so excited to get married, you've waited for so long and you get married and if you're not careful, if you don't work for it, it just gets routine. And it's called hedonistic adaptation. We adapt, we grow comfortable, it's a part of our human nature. And listen, it's one of the greatest spiritual dangers that we can face. 
adapting to Jesus and just taking him for granted and thinking, yeah, he did that, but maybe it's not enough. Maybe, maybe I need to do more. Don't get used to Jesus. Don't, don't get comfortable with Jesus. Don't let your belief in his superior power to save start to diminish. We, we do that with things as humans, but don't let it happen with Jesus. Don't deviate from the gospel. Don't get sidetracked by anything else. Jesus is enough, he's always been enough, and he will always be enough for us. And so here's my prayer for us today, this week as we move forward, that, that we'd all have a fresh new revelation and understanding of who Jesus is, that we see him for who he truly is. That he's our creator, our sustainer, our hope, our salvation, our bread of life, the fountain of life. He's the cornerstone. He's the chief. He's everything that we need. He's more than sufficient for us. He's everything. And, and I know what a religious person that may be sitting here today might be thinking. Well, well Nolan, just because Jesus saves us, does that mean that we can just go live however we want to? Are you, are you advocating for just living a crazy life? Well, I'm saved. I can do whatever because Jesus has saved me. No, it's not what I'm saying at all. That, that's the opposite of what I'm saying. Because when we get Jesus in the right perspective, we get our lives lined up right. Because we're no longer trying to do things to earn God's love and to earn his acceptance. We're not doing it because we know we've already got it because of what Jesus did for us. So instead, there's a pivot, there's a switch where we get to live life in light of his grace, doing our best to honor a Savior that's loved us so much and that's done so much for us. I don't try to live my life to honor God because I think he doesn't love me. I've done that before. I don't do that anymore because I've been set free from that crap. I, I do that because he's been so good to me. I want to give him my best. And I want to honor a savior that's been so good. And listen, friends, that's a much freer way to live, isn't it? No longer bound by the religion of do, but able to rest in the freedom of his grace. Jesus plus nothing is everything that we need. He's more than sufficient. He's able to save us. He's able to keep us. When we mess up again, he's, he's, he's covered us. And when we get him in the right perspective, we get to live life in pursuit of a savior that's been so good. So let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, would you, get, would you let me understand you more? If there's any religion that's been poured into my mind that I, I've thought and I've got you misconstrued or I haven't thought you more than enough, even if I don't say it, God, would you take that out of me? Because I, I wanna recognize you for who you are, the creator of everything, the creator of this new life. You're the savior of my soul. And Jesus, you're all that we need. When we get Jesus in the right perspective, it's the greatest thing we could ever do in this life. We pray for us today. Father, I thank you for every single person that's here. Father, let us have a new revelation of who you are, a new understanding. I've got a new picture. Maybe our picture of you is a scolding, an angry Jesus, a, a always disappointed Jesus. Let us understand you for who you are. That's not you, Jesus. You're loving, you're gracious, you're kind, you're merciful. You go above and beyond. You've done it for us, Jesus. Let us rest in that. Let us, let us not get religion twisted. Let's not throw and heap that junk back on our lives. You've already set us free from it, but let us rest in your grace. And Father, if there's anybody here that hasn't made the decision to make you the Lord or leader of their life, let today be the day that they do it. Let today be the day where they step up and they step out and say, Jesus, I'm choosing you because you did all this for me. And I know that you've, you're gonna give me life. You're gonna give me a future. You're gonna give me eternity. I wanna make you Lord and I wanna make you leader. If, if that's you today, make that decision. Pray that prayer. Jesus, I choose you. Father, I pray for all of us today. Let us this week fix our eyes on Jesus, as scripture says, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let us grow in understanding of you. God, we love you. We thank you. God, be with your people this week. I pray that you would bless them that you'd keep them, that you'd cause your face to shine upon them. God, that you'd be gracious to them, give them favor in their life, give them peace in their lives. Lord, help us to be a light in this dark world. It's in Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.
Amen. Amen. Well, guys, we love you. Next Steps class, we're going to start in here. It's 1131. We'll start at 1137, just to make it awkward. 1137, meet in here. If you have kids, let them know next door and just say, hey, I got, I got kids, but I'm going to go to the Next Steps class. They'll watch them for you. But the rest of you guys, if you're new today, stop by the first time guest tent. Let them know you're new, but we love you. We'll see you next time here at Motion.